Hello. Huh, I'm going to take a deep breath and wait a second um, while we welcome you in. And um, I'm Mel Robbins. You are watching Stay Connected with Mel Robbins. It is March 26. Yes, it is Thursday. At least it is Thursday here in the United States. And I want to welcome you. If you have uh, been watching Stay Connected with Mel Robbins for a while, welcome back. If you're brand new to our weekday uh, live stream, welcome. Uh, I want to say hello to everybody coming in. Um, Iowa, hello. Uh, new Mexico, hello. Ireland, hello. hello. Brazil, hello. Um, Dubai, hello, Traverse City, Michigan, woo, got the mitten up, Belgium, awesome, welcome to Sacramento, welcome Morocco, Jersey in the house, I got the fist bump for the Jersey folks, Venezuela, love it, hello from Michigan, the Netherlands, I love our community, Kuwait, uh, truly global community watching Stay Connected, and Stay Connected with Mel Robbins uh, is here for one reason. It's to help you stay connected to yourself and to a global community uh, around the world that is here to encourage you and to help you through this collective moment of anxiety and through uncertainty. And every single day we get together, uh, if you're on the West Coast in the United States, in California or Washington, we are on at 9 a.m. If you're on the East Coast of the United States, I go live every weekday at noon. If you're in London, it's 4 p.m. If you are in India, it is 9.30 at night. And if you are our friends in Australia, it is three o'clock in the morning. Every single weekday I am here because we are stronger together and there are simple things that you can do. Even in a very overwhelming moment of time, simple things you can do every day to make your day a little better. You know, you've heard me say a million times, if you've been following me for a while, that uh, you are one decision away from a different life. And what Stay Connected with Mel Robbins is about is the fact that you are one decision away from a better day. And today we're going to be talking about something um, as we welcome you in from around the world. And if you're new to this, the way that we begin is just with a quick check in. Hello, Moscow. I'm giving you the thumbs up right here, the little uh, emoji that you gave me. Um, the way that we start this is I want you to go to the comment wherever it is that you're watching from. We are live right now on LinkedIn. We are live on Twitter. We are live on YouTube. We are live on Facebook and we are live on Instagram. Wherever you are watching and tuning in, please go right to the comments and uh, tell us where you are watching from. And today's topic, hello, Iran. Hello, Atlanta. Oh, another person in Iran. We've got uh, Germany, Hungary on YouTube. We've got somebody tuning in from Aruba. We've got uh, people all over the place in LinkedIn. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And today I got a topic. Oh uh, boy, do I have a topic. Are you worried that your parents or your grandparents are not taking the coronavirus seriously enough? I want that to set in for a minute. I've been noticing articles popping up all over the place and I myself am having this issue with people in my life who are older, who I feel are not getting the risk right now and are not getting the urgent moment of time. So wherever you're tuning in from, give me a thumbs up if you feel like you are overly worried about your parents and your grandparents and that they seem to not be taking the coronavirus that seriously. I see a ton of, yes, yes, he's a trucker. Yes, yes, it's my brother. Yes, it's my grandfather who's still playing golf every day. Yes. My 93-year-old mother-in-law you're worried about. Yes, as long as there's a bridge uh, uh, group meeting, my mom is going out. And why can I not get her to understand the seriousness of this? That's what we're talking about today. And I've got some unbelievably simple and helpful advice. And before I was on with you, I was on with Dr. Oz talking about this topic 
because so many of us are struggling because we know that right now um, the coronavirus is a global phenomenon and whether or not your community has been impacted at a profound level the way that our friends i see this my stepfather who has diabetes you're worried about my aunt she just keeps going to all these stores i offered to help and my grandparents and parents don't want it um my dad is going shopping every day because he's bored my mom is 85 um and i'm seeing from our friends in europe and in, in the czech republic it's the opposite my parents are crazy depressed my grandmother is not taking this seriously. And so all of us, as we come to this broadcast every day to talk about our own emotional resilience, which basically means your ability to be steady and calm when you meet a crisis and when you meet a challenge. And this is a collective opportunity for us all to practice the skill of being emotionally resilient. And so today we're gonna to talk about what do you do when you're worried about your parents or your grandparents or your elderly colleagues, neighbors, friends, aunts, uncles, who do not seem to be taking the threat seriously. And look, I'm with you. I'm with you about this because when I look at the facts and right now is a time to tune into doctors and experts who have studied epidemiology and experts that have studied infectious disease. It is a time to look at the data. It is very clear in my mind, as you look at how the United States is tracking, we are tracking exactly as Spain as Italy has. Why we are not in a nationwide not lockdown is beyond me. I'm not in control of that, but I think we are all going to be having to be concerned about our parents and our grandparents until the government orders a nationwide lockdown because until this is the thing that i've come to realize people don't change until it impacts them personally and as long as it's happening out there i don't need to worry about it and for many of your parents and grandparents even if they have diabetes even if they have pre-existing conditions even if they've beaten cancer even if they have lung problems even if they've been a smoker they literally, unless it impacts them directly, as in right now, they are likely going to treat this as something that's happening to other people because that's what human beings do. And I also have come to realize that a lot of people, when they face something that's scary, because being in a moment of discomfort and fear is so uncomfortable, what a lot of people do when they face something that's scary is instead of taking it seriously, they give themselves a false sense of safety. They go into a denial mode. So one of the things I want you to realize is that the reason why your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and uncles may be going about their life as business as usual is because it's a coping mechanism for the fear they feel deep inside that they don't want to admit is real. That how could this possibly be serious if Home Depot is still open? Why should I be concerned? My private golf club is, is, is still letting us play golf. We just have to drive in our carts alone. Why would I be concerned? The bridge tournament's still happening. And so what I want you to understand is that I think it's a normal response to fear and uncertainty, to pretend and to be in denial that this impacts you until you are forced to face it. And so today I'm gonna to talk about various strategies that you can use to help the people that are not taking this seriously to face this. Because I, I know this is true that until one of their friends is diagnosed, your parents and grandparents will not think this is gonna impact them. Until the government shuts down the entire country that you're living in, your parents and your grandparents are going to think that this is not that big of a deal and it doesn't impact them. Or until you have a conversation with them that makes them understand how their nonchalant nature about this is impacting your health and wellness your anxiety and your feels until you make it personal for them, nothing is going to change and your worry is just going to increase. So let me talk about some things that you need to do because look, tough times, 
Tough times require tough love. And tough love is best delivered, not in an order, not in a make wrong, not in you being righteous, but tough love during tough times is much better delivered in a longer sit down, deeper conversation. Okay, because I'm seeing I'm seeing what you guys are writing. Your parents are in complete denial. Your grandparents are in complete denial. And so we're going to talk a lot today about a phrase that I learned from my friend, Carrie Lorenz. She is the first female uh, F-14 fighter pilot in the United States. She is kick ass, a best selling author. And she has this saying that I love. It's not about who's right or wrong. It's about what's right. I'm going to say that again. For those of you arguing with your parents and your grandparents or your kids about the seriousness of the threat of the coronavirus to every human being on this planet, it's not about who's right or wrong right now. It's about what's right. And the only thing that's right in this moment is your safety and your family's safety. That's it. If you get into a paradigm with your parents or your grandparents about who's right or who's wrong about what's happening, you will just get deadlocked into an argument. The only way to convince somebody that you love is to focus on what's right, which is someone's safety and your family's safety. And so I'm gonna share with you a story and then I'm going to share with you a couple tricks that you can use in these conversations, okay? Because I think your parents and your grandparents, when they see the news and they see the facts, and the facts are very simple. This is going to impact every human being on the planet. There's no doubt about it. This is going to be a virus that every one of us is exposed to. There's no doubt about it. And so what's right to do right now is to put your safety and your family's safety first. And I've struggled with this too. So I'm super close with my parents. And my parents uh, spend the winters down in the panhandle of Florida in the Destin area, an area of the United States that I absolutely love on the Gulf of Mexico. It's something they look forward to every year. Our family's been going down there for 20 years. And when this first hit, there was no one in the panhandle that had been diagnosed. This was mostly like a New York and a Los Angeles thing. And so again, back to the first thing I told you, human beings don't change until it becomes personal. And so as you watch the Canera virus, or Panera, I keep calling it Canera, like Panera bread, the coronavirus go to, uh, start spreading and it starts becoming more and more real, that's when people start to pay attention. So I would share with my parents because it was two weeks ago today, everybody, two weeks ago today, that my daytime talk show, so I'm a best-selling author, you can see all the books behind me. In fact, you probably can't even see all of them. But uh, the book I wrote, The Five Second Rule, I wrote it three, published it three years ago. It's been read by more than a million people and it's been translated into 32 languages. And those are some of the languages of the books behind me because I love to see the global impact that we're making. And um, so my show got canceled two weeks ago because we were taping at CBS Broadcast Center and people inside of CBS News had tested positive. So there's proof, change, People don't want to change until it becomes personal. When there is a positive diagnosis at your work, in your community, in your friend group, at your school, it becomes personal, boom, immediately. Show immediately canceled, no questions asked. The show will be on television until September, but we are no longer taping episodes, okay? So I left New York City two weeks ago. My husband and I immediately went into a form of social isolation, we bunkered down at the house. We canceled all our travel plans. Um, a week went by and then our daughters came home from college, which you know what that means? That means the clock on you being socially isolated goes back to zero. This is one of the reasons why you putting your family's safety first is imperative right now. Because the moment you go into isolation, the clock begins for how long you're protecting yourself. The second that one of your kids comes home from college or they go on spring break and they come home or you go visit your parents or your parents now join you, everything goes back to day one. And so it's important for you to realize, look, 
you're the leader of your pack. If you're paying the rent, if you're buying the food, if you're paying for the phone, if it's your house, it's your rules. Tough times mean tough love. And the number one rule in our household is safety. We, I am not even entertaining conversations with our 21 and 19 year old right now about their independence and their personal freedoms and the fact that they're bored. I don't give a shit because the number one job that I have right now as a parent is to keep your ass safe and to keep myself safe. And it's frustrating when it's your own parents and grandparents who are not making decisions that keep them safe. And they're grown ass adults. You can't do anything about it. And so you're going to have to resort to different strategies, strategies different than making them wrong. You're going to have to resort to strategies that I'm going to give you, super simple strategies to deal with the stubborn people in your life that you love who are not protecting themselves from the very real threat of the coronavirus. Because I'm going to explain to you what happens for somebody that is in their 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s when they turn on the news. The news is terrifying because the news that you see is that the virus is coming to your neighborhood. The news that you see is that hospitals are overwhelmed. The news that you see is scary stuff like the fact that there are refrigerator trucks outside of hospitals in the United, in, in New York City because the morgues are so filled with people. And the news that you see are doctors pleading with you to stay home. And what people in that age group also see is that when there's a ventilator shortage, who are they gonna choose? It's not gonna be the 80 year olds and the 70 year olds. It's gonna be the people with a better expectancy because that's what's happening in other countries. And so if you see that news, you have two choices, right? You can either accept that news as fact and you can start to do what's right, which is to keep yourself safe given what's happening. Or you can make a second choice and you can convince yourself that this doesn't affect you and you can go in denial because you're actually scared. And that's what I think most senior citizens are doing. I think most people that are 65 and above have a level of fear about this that has placed a, a, a place them in denial. And they are coping by giving themselves false senses of safety. They're not being, uh, they're, they're not, it's almost like they're not even being irrational. It's a coping mechanism that somehow if I can go to Home Depot and Home Depot is still open, being able to do something that feels normal makes me feel like I'm in control. But what we know is that they're right. Going to Home Depot, going to the, the, the pharmacy, it's something that's normal. So it makes you feel like things are normal. It makes you feel okay. They're right about that. But it's not about who's right or wrong. It's about what's right. And what's right is to do things that keep you safe. And this is where we need to take the conversation. And so I'm going to give you three words, three words that come from my friend, Carrie Lorenz, that will help you convince anybody to do anything when you're arguing with them. Are you ready? Those three words, have you considered? Have you considered? Because if you say you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do the other thing, every 60, 70, 80, 90 year old in your life are basically gonna be like, who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, why are you telling, excuse me? Um, I lived through Vietnam. I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I lived through that panic that everybody had called uh, Y2K. Uh, I think we'll be okay. Have your parents been saying that to you, right? So um, my parents have. But then what happens is, as the coronavirus starts to get closer and closer and closer to them, and stores are closing, and friends are getting diagnosed, and hospitals are getting overrun, then they'll start to take it seriously. So how do we accelerate that? I want you to use the phrase, have you considered? Have you considered allows you to share in a tough love conversation all the things that you're worried about. Have you considered that when you go to the hospital, no one will be able to be with you. Have you considered that? 
Have you considered that if you are put on a ventilator that and it doesn't work, you will die alone? Have you considered that if you show up to the hospital a week from now and there are no hospital beds, given your age, if they have to ration care, you will not be given it. Have you considered, mom, have you considered, dad, that I am not sleeping at night because I am so worried about you? Have you considered that what you're doing is giving me so much anxiety, mom? And if you cared about my health, you would protect your safety, mom. Using the words, have you considered, allows you to elevate what's right, which is your safety, okay? I don't want you to get into the finger wagging because, you know, I, I my parents thankfully um, made the decision. My father was a orthopedic surgeon for his entire life and they made the decision as they started to see this getting closer and closer and closer, they said, you know what? It's not when this happens. It's, it's not if it happens, it's when it happens. And I would rather be in Michigan, in our hometown, surrounded by friends and neighbors and at the hospital that I used to work at if this, you know, when this happens, than being in Florida in a vacation town surrounded by tons of people our age that are gonna overrun the beds. So my parents thankfully drove back home to Michigan last week. Thank you, mom and dad. I was sleeping better immediately. My mother-in-law on the other hand, who I love dearly, is um, making me crazy because she's 84 years old. And I know she jumped out of an airplane to celebrate her 80th birthday. And I know she goes for a four mile walk every day and she is literally one of the fittest people I know but she's 84 freaking years old. And she is in Florida right now, where half the population, I don't know that this is true, but that's where a lot of old people are. So the first place where the beds are gonna get overrun and ventilators are gonna run out is likely gonna be Florida. And Florida still hasn't put the whole state in a shutdown. For crying out loud, they didn't even shut down the beaches until a couple days ago. So, you know, I, I said to her, I'm terrified about you. And you know what she said to me? Brace yourself, everybody. She said, I'm okay because there's a bridge to get over here to Vero Beach. <laughs> there's a bridge, everybody. I'm like, woman, this is a virus that has traveled across oceans, that has jumped from country and to country. You don't need a passport to get this thing. This is airborne. And it is coming. And just because there's nobody diagnosed in your county, probably because nobody's been tested yet, everybody's grandkids just came down to visit them for freaking February break. You don't think that this is going to be a disaster? You're still going to your golf club? And you think just because you get in the golf cart and drive alone? Now, do you see that my tone of voice? It's a make wrong. It's a make wrong. When you communicate like that, you communicate, I think you're an idiot. And there is no faster way to get somebody to dig their heels in than to communicate that way. And so it's not about who's right or who's wrong because she's right, there's a bridge. But it's about what's right. And what's right is, is taking every precaution right now to keep yourself safe. And in my mind, I would feel a lot better, and I know my husband would, if she weren't in Florida, but if she were back home in Vermont. So I started using the have you considered? And I think the one that probably flipped a switch was when I said, have you considered that if you do get sick and you do go into the hospital, no one in the family will be able to go into that hospital to see you? And I know her family is more important than anything. And I think it was that thought because when we spoke to her last night, she's now contemplating caravanning back to Vermont with some of her friends. Have you considered is like dropping a little grenade in somebody's head. 
and it makes them start to ruminate on the facts that are making you stressed out. And what happens is somebody comes to their own conclusion when you say, have you considered? Nobody wants to be shamed into changing. Nobody wants to be berated into changing. Nobody wants to be made wrong right now. Everybody is afraid of this thing. Even those of you that keep saying, oh, this is God's plans. It is what it is. Whatever you need to say in order to keep yourself calm, keep saying it. But it's not about who's right or wrong. It's about what's right. And what's right now is not only your safety, your family's safety, but what also is right is the safety of doctors and staying home because that's the right thing to do. Yeah, you may not end up in a hospital, mm -hmm. but what's right is for all of us to isolate ourselves so if we have it and don't know it and are non-symptomatic, we don't infect everybody else's grandparents that are over at CVS and Home Depot run an errand so that they can give themselves a false sense of safety. That's why we are self-isolating. So I wanna take a few questions. If you have some specific questions about this topic, please put them in the comments and we'll see if we can get to some of them. The first one I'm gonna take is from Facebook. This is Lisa from New Jersey. Lisa, um, my 80 year old father gets in his car every day to go shop Rite Aid to look for Scott paper towels and toilet paper. How can I explain to him it's dangerous for him to be in a grocery store? He will not listen to me. So Lisa, you are all of us. And your grandfather who goes to Rite Aid every single day to look for Scott paper towels and his toilet paper, that is a coping mechanism. Your 80 year old father is probably too proud of a man to admit to you that he is afraid of this. And the fact that he is going to the store, something that he does all the time, part of his normal routine, and he's looking for a particular item, Scott paper towel and Scott toilet paper. That is a creature comfort. That brand makes him feel safe. And it's what he's doing in order to tell himself he's still okay. The only way you're gonna convince him that this is dangerous is for you to sit down with him and for you to tell him over FaceTime, if you got, and, and I'm gonna say something if he's living with you too, and tell him this scares you to death and come up with about 10, have you considered, have you considered, have you considered, have you considered? and pause after each one and let him answer. Have you considered how I'm gonna feel, dad, if you get this because somebody else touched that toilet paper box that you picked up and you caught it at Rite Aid because it lives on a surface for 14 days, that's what the doctors are saying, and you go to the hospital, dad, and you are on a ventilator and I'm not allowed to come see you. You guys, our dog was really sick the other day and we took him to the vet. This was two days ago. We couldn't go into the vet with him. They had to come out with gloves and masks on and take our dog from the car and into the vet because of the coronavirus. So if you start saying, have you considered how I'm gonna feel, daddy? if you're in the hospital and I can't come in and be with you, I'm sure he hasn't considered that. The other thing I want you to know is if they're living with you, it's your house, so it's your rules. He can ride in the car with you, but he can't go in with you. It's your house, your rules. And we don't wanna have these conversations because they're uncomfortable but you have to have these conversations. Um, and look, I don't know if it lives on a surface for 14 days. I've read nine days, I've read 14 days, I've read five days. It's not about who's right or who's wrong. It's about what's right. And so what's right is protecting yourself. What's right is you being safe. And so Anne from Connecticut, let's take another one. She wrote on LinkedIn, I am my mother's lifeline and because of her age, I have to keep six feet away from her. How do I explain an elbow bump to an 83 year old mom? 
How do I try to control her anxiety when I'm trying to control mine? Excellent question. Um, the reason why you're doing the elbow bumps is because if you're the one going out and getting groceries, you're taking extra steps in order to protect your mom when you come back home. And so I think what you need to do is if she doesn't understand the elbow bump, just explain it to her. We need to do this mom because I don't know what I would do if anything happened to you. And I don't know what I would do. I would never forgive myself if by running out to the store, I brought it back into this household and I infected you. And so I'm taking every precaution, whether you think it's silly or not, mom, because I love you and I would never forgive myself if I did that to you. And so I think that's what you have to do. And by you prioritizing safety and by you maintaining a steadiness and a calmness, you will help your mother maintain a steadiness and a calmness. And, you know, these are weird times for all of us. I mean, I need to remind you that none of us have ever gone through anything like this before. I know you may have survived some really crazy, whacked out, challenging stuff in your life, but none of us have ever lived through a pandemic. And so we're all doing it together for the first time. But I really want you to understand that your feelings are valid. And so are your parents' and your grandparents' feelings. And... So number one, when you sit down and you have those tough conversations, because that's what tough times and tough love require, always validate somebody's feeling. I know you think this is stupid. I know you think you're not going to get it. I know you think that this is all, you know, something that the media has cooked up. I know you think that this isn't coming to your town because you have a bridge. I hear you. Validating what somebody's saying lowers their uh, desire to argue with you. And then you keep focusing on, but what's right is our safety. What's right is your safety. What's right is self-isolating so that we can not spread this to other people who are compromised and so that we can all together flatten this curve down. And mom, have you considered? That's your three steps today, everybody. Validate somebody's feelings. It's not about who's right or wrong. It's about what's right. And have you considered? And I'll have to report back on whether or not my mother-in-law is driving home to Vermont. I sure hope so. I would love and feel like, oh, gosh, hopefully she'll be in a place um, where she's less likely to get infected and where she's with the community of people that she knows. But, you know, look, at the end of the day, she is a grown woman and she's going to make her own decisions. And all I can do is have her consider things that concern me. And I am so happy that my parents are home. And this, by the way, is why it is critical for every politician to have a moment of courage right now and to just shut the shit down. Because the longer that we are all allowed to kind of do this however we think we should do this, the longer we're going to be dealing with this. And until there is a universal, we're just shutting this down for a couple of weeks and getting everybody off the streets. And we are doing this for doctors and hospitals and for all of humanity. Every time somebody goes out of your house and comes back, it's potentially back to day one of quarantining. And so I am hoping, hoping that um, as we build our resilience here with Stay Connected, that the folks that are in power to make decisions are making courageous decisions. And, you know, I've reminded you every day, we can't control how other people are responding to this, but you can always control how you do. And that's why you got to prioritize your safety. It's why you got to focus on your emotional resilience. And, you know, the other thing that you can do, this has worked really helpful with our kids, is anchoring in the future. Hey, mom, you know, we can elbow bump right now, but we're going to see each other. We're going to go to Disney World this fall. We're going to go back down to Florida next year, anchoring people in the future. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Um, also, um, this is a very hard thing to do, but it's really important that you practice restraint when it comes to celebrating milestones with your parents and your grandparents, particularly if you have kids in your house and you have not been fully isolating for a couple of weeks. 
and that is FaceTime. This is Megan from our team. She was heartbroken because she lives in New York City and it was her dad's 80th birthday. And she chose to not go to Philadelphia. Why? Because she loves him and she did not want to expose him. And so here she is on FaceTime with him at his 80th birthday. And this is what you do when you love somebody. You make the hard choices. And, you know, none of us chose this, but we can choose what we do in response to it. And that's why I'm here every day to help you stay connected, to help you stay strong, to remind you that we're going to get through this together and that it's not about who's right or wrong. It's about what's right. And what's right is your mental, physical, and emotional safety. So take it seriously. I hope this helped. If it did help, please, please, please share this with all your friends and family. If you go to melrobbins.com slash stay connected, you can see a whole list of all the episodes so far. We've been doing this uh, for over a week now. We were featured on Dr. Oz and will be uh, again tomorrow. So tune into Dr. Oz. Keep tuning into the Mel Robbins Show, which is airing nationwide in the United States five days a week on television. And make sure you're right back here every single weekday online with me, Mel Robbins, for Stay Connected. And if you want one more resource, if you go to Facebook, I don't know where my photo is. If you go to Facebook and search Stay Connected with Mel Robbins, you'll find our global community. There's almost 15,000 people in our community. Uh, it's nothing but people that are encouraging and supporting one another. No updates about COVID or coronavirus, just encouragement, humor, fun, global community coming together to help you through this moment of worry and uncertainty. And I promise you, you stay with me, you will emerge from this stronger and better version of yourself. Now, in case nobody tells you today that they love you, I'm going to tell you I love you. Because when you go talk to your family about this stuff, they're going to tell you they hate you. They're going to tell you you're wrong. Just keep telling them, have you considered? And I want you to know that I love you and believe in you. And we're going to get through this together.